In this Inspired Insider.com interview, we talked to Ben Greenfield. Ben gets over a million podcast downloads every two months. He runs multiple businesses. He talks about what flopped, so you make sure not to do it. And he also talks about what helped him get a huge amount of traction to gain a following, so you make sure to do this. Also, he talks about what he did with his first product launch when he made more in a week than he had in the previous six months. There was also, listen up when there's a big oops moment, what he realized after he surveyed his list that he would not have known otherwise. So make sure that you survey your list and listen to what he finds out. At the end, I ask him what his wife told him he should never do again. That and much more. Jeremy Weiss here. We're here with Ben Greenfield. Ben is the host of Get Fit Guy, the number one fitness podcast on iTunes. It gets a million po podcast downloads every two months, which is unbelievable. He's the owner of bengreenfieldfitness.com, which is ranked as one of the top 100 fitness websites. Believe it or not, he has many more businesses and blogs, all while doing triathlons and Ironman and much more. Ben, thanks for being here. Yo, Jeremy, what's up? Thanks awesome for the to intro, talk man. to you. The man, the myth, the legend. I've been waiting for months to talk to you, and now here we are. <laughs> so, Ben, we get a lot of comments from people who have tons of ideas, they don't know where to start, or they have a current product or service and are trying to get traction with sales, it's not growing quite as fast as they want it to, or sometimes they just have that fear of failure, embarrassment of starting something with family and friends. So, you're an amazing person to talk about. How'd you get go from that idea to growing a cult following to actually making your first sale in dollar and way beyond that. And before we talk about that, I want to, I always like to include a fun fact. And a fun fact about Ben is he played the violin for 13 years and he was actually president of the chess club. So beyond <laughs> the brawn, he also has the brains. <laughs> You just call me a nerd, dude. That's that's All okay. Right. <laughs> I could I could take it. <laughs> so, my propeller, my propeller hat hiding under my desk here. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. That that's a great question about where that first idea came from and 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 how I grew it. Um, you know, one of the things that I think that's really important here, like kind of mindset for people starting off, yeah. is that you know there there's very seldomly like some kind of a some kind of an easy road in, some kind of a big lucky moment, some Oprah moment that you discover. That doesn't happen to very many people. Right. I'm really jealous of the folks that it does happen to because that's great for them, whatever. Um, I actually can't think of anybody actually off the top of my head who I know of who's, who's really had the, truly that Oprah moment where you didn't put any work in at all. You know, everybody's, that's a bad analogy. Everybody's been on Oprah has put in a, a ton of work, really. <laughs> right. But, um, you know, ultimately, for me, it all started, you know, literally, I was putting in 16-hour days as a personal trainer, you know, starting off in, in college. I remember I, I worked at a, at a French bakery in college, and across the street from the French bakery was a gym, and so I'd sell people croissants and donuts in the morning and then go over <laughs> across the street in the afternoon and, and train them. And through college, I was a personal trainer and I managed the wellness program at University of Idaho as I was going through graduate school. And I studied a lot and I took a lot of credits and I trained a lot of people and I put a lot of, of time in the trenches, so to speak. And um, you know, that was not really where, where my big uh, idea necessarily um, uh, was, was hatched from, even though it was related to that. But I want to say that because it really is important that you understand that behind every big idea, there's always that, there's always that time that you put in the trenches, right? right. There's always that experience that you have to have. Right. And it's very, very important that people realize that you don't just – Think of a big idea and then switch industries. Switch what you're doing. Switch what your experience is from. You know, I I could have when I when I first got the idea to start doing more dot com style stuff to launch my own product. 
I could have switched industries, you know, gotten into whatever the financial industry or, you know, something of that nature. But instead I decided to kind of, kind of play in the, in the realm that I was comfortable with that I'd put some time into. And there's, there's absolutely no issue with doing that. You know, if someone's watching, they're listening and whatever they work in, you know, whatever cell phones or finance or, you know, any other number of things, it's okay to stick with your industry and then launch that big idea. So for me, you know, I'm working as a personal trainer, I'm running all these gyms and personal training studios, and I just really applied myself um, with as much excellence as possible to my job to get the best results from my clients as possible in terms of helping them to achieve their dreams. And a local physician who I happen to work with, who I got a lot of referrals from, he nominated me for for this uh, award through what's called the National Strength and Conditioning Association. Yeah, it's the biggest and they have this yeah. this it's the biggest one. It's yeah. the only internationally recognized certifying body in fitness and um, I was nominated and, and ended up being voted as the the National Personal Trainer of the Year wow. in 2008 which kind of got me uh, some speaking gigs. I, I went on and I spoke at a few big fitness conferences and I remember at one of those conferences uh, another gentleman spoke and he was in, in dot com. He was doing things online and he was doing quite a bit in terms of affiliates and, and Clickbank stuff and um, you know, p people who are in fitness probably know who this guy is. His name is Vince Delmoni and um, I, I was listening to him talk, and I didn't realize you could make that much money online in fitness. I thought fitness was about, I thought the way that you made it in fitness was you just started a lot of gyms and just like rinse, wash, and repeat and do like the old, you know, whatever, 24 hour fitness or model or, or anytime fitness or whatever. And that was kind of my plan. Right. I was just going to open up lots of personal training studios and gyms and continue to work my fingers to the bone as I had been doing. And I remember I was there at that conference and, my wife was pregnant at the time with our twin boys, and I was kind of, you know, I was seeing my future laid out before me as, you know, continuing to to get up at 5 a.m. to train clients and go to bed at, you know, 8, 9, 10 p.m. or, or leave work at 8, 9, 10 p.m. Mm -hmm. when the gym closed. And I remember listening to Vince, and he was talking about this ebook that he did. It was called, like, The Skinny Guy's Savior or something like that, where he helped skinny guys get big. And... I just started thinking about me and how I was involved at that point with with triathlon, you know, as you mentioned, and you know, getting into Ironman triathlon. And I thought, you know, I'm running all these businesses, starting a family. You know, I have all these side hobbies. wasn't doing violin and chess anymore, but you know, I like to drink red wine and play guitar and read books and write. And I thought, you know, I I think that that maybe I could just teach some other people how to also do. Iron Man triathlon, like like I really really love to do, but also have a life, right? Have a social life, still make money, um, still have have friends and family and, and career, not have to get a divorce and leave your kids to be able to go out and do something like Iron Man triathlon. And I learned later that it probably would have been a better idea to have pulled my audience, the small audience that I did have at that point, and kind of find out if that was a good idea or not. But I gambled and rolled with it because I thought it was a good idea. And the gamble won, fortunately, in, in that case. And I've made other gambles we can talk about later on that, that didn't <laughs> turn out quite so well. But I, but I spent about six months creating this product, uh, recording MP3s and videos and PDF and just kind of doing the typical information product, online information product. And then I, I launched it and started selling it and started making money from it. And that was really my first major product that I launched that allowed me to to make a living on the Internet. But it all started with that idea of here's what I'm doing, here's where my passion is, here's how I'm doing it, and I want to teach other people how I'm doing it. Yeah, I want to so. go back to that moment when you decided you had the idea, but then you acted on it. And mm -hmm. what prompted you to actually, I know, what happened in March of 2009? Where you decided to just sell everything? Well, March of 2009 was was kind of the point where let's see, my kids were my kids were were almost exactly one year old in March of 2009. March of 2008 is when they were actually 
born. And it was kind of between 08 and 09 when I, when, you know, as, as I was starting to raise that young family that I realized I just can't do this anymore. Like I, I cannot be running all these businesses and driving around and managing these trainers and managing all these clients. And that was a great chapter of my life, right? That was the chapter I'd been living for a decade. And you got to have those chapters where you put that time in the trenches and you learn how to be mm-hmm. really, really good at what you do. But I had to figure out how to leverage that and be able to deliver the value that I was getting a great deal of satisfaction out of delivering, helping people achieve their dreams, change their bodies, cross the finish line of a triathlon, whatever. But I had to be able to replicate that and still do what what I really wanted to do, what was going to make me happy which was to be with my family, to raise my family. Mm-hmm. We homeschool our kids and everything. So, so for me, um, the the defining moment, you know, I'd, I got to tell you, I, like I remember sitting there um, in that conference that I was at, that I was talking about, listening to uh, to to Vince, and there there were some other people talking there too who were doing well on the internet. But I remember listening to him, and I was sitting there. I had my little yellow notepad, and I was literally like writing down. I, I remember I wrote, I wrote down, I, I wanted to call it the CEO Ironman, uh, CEO Ironman Triathlon. So later, later on, Ironman shut me down and I had to I had to get rid of the word Ironman in hmm. there because um, it's a patented or whatever, or trademarked. Yeah, yeah. But um, now, and now it's called the Triathlon Dominator is what it's called. But originally it was just the, the CEO and, and I wanted to market it to wealthy CEOs who'd spend money on this program and I could upsell them and other stuff. And, but I, I, Literally, like over the course of an hour, just attached the whole thing on a little yellow legal notepad, sitting there thinking about how I was going to free myself from having to work so many hours in my job and and have something on the side that I could sell that I could you know make money on while I was you know sleeping, so to speak. Yeah, I mean, you've built a huge following, and for someone who's just starting, or even someone who's been doing it a while and haven't hasn't grown that following, what's something early on that you found that flop that didn't work and then what's something that you found that actually gave you some traction early on mm, something that flopped that didn't work um, for me and this I thought this was a really cool idea was I wanted to um, basically begin going in and um, helping uh, Wikipedia articles in my niche like literally like all the Wikipedia articles in triathlon and the history of triathlon and multi-sport and triathlon like take all the Wikipedia entries and go in and modify them accurately but then I also bought a bunch of websites and had VAs create articles that were related to like the history of triathlon and triathlon facts and everything and so I had these websites that I was linking from Wikipedia too and I thought I was totally seems like a good idea I mean they get they're high on the search engines why didn't oh, yeah. it work and then ads and affiliate ads on, right. on the websites that the people were, were winding up on and um, no I didn't and, and there's a bunch of those Wikipedia articles still there and I've maybe made like whatever all of 10 cents off of off of those ads and those click like people people don't go shopping on Wikipedia right it's kind of like the idea behind Facebook like if you're gonna sell something on Facebook you don't list your product on uh, as a as a Facebook ad because people that, like do you go to Facebook to go shopping? You go to Amazon. You go to Facebook yeah. to talk to your friends and right. to watch funny videos and to see you you know what what are they called the the memes the the little quote pictures and the funny stuff. Like if you're gonna advertise on Facebook, that's the stuff you advertise: free video, cool meme, funny saying, funny quote. Mm-hmm. People click through and eventually you might upsell them or collect their email. But you know, Wikipedia people don't click through Wikipedia articles and, and click on on ads that often. I found so that was an idea. Good point. Flopped. And I I spent a lot of money and a lot of time like training VAs how to write these articles and launch these websites and it sucked. Bad idea. So what was something um, that gave you some good traction early on? Because um, I mean, you get a million downloads, and that's just on one of the blogs every two months. I mean, if yeah. you think of the population of the U.S., you know, <laughs> it's crazy. 
Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, I'm not going to lie. A big part of that is, is fitness, like not triathlon, which is a small niche, but fitness, like the get fit guy podcast, Mm -hmm. um, which is part of the quick and dirty tips network, which is like this, this network of advice columns in iTunes. And by the way, that's a really good idea. If you can get, if you can have like a network on iTunes rather than having a standalone podcast, Mm -hmm. because people download one podcast in the network and then they get all the others recommended to them and they kind of get which is you know that that's that's a division of Macmillan publishing that whole quick and dirty tips network and um so a, it's a it's a cool idea but um that relates to my response to your question because it's podcasting like i remember i was sitting um i was still running my gym when i did my first podcast and i was i remember i was sitting there in my gym between clients it was a video podcast because I didn't know how to do an audio one, so I just turned on my, you know, like like the you webcam. and I are talking right now on the webcam. I turned mm. on the webcam and I recorded for about ten minutes, and I was I was reporting on recent research from the Journal of Strength Conditioning <laughs> Research, and I did about four of those, and I just pumped them out on iTunes, and then I decided that the video took too much time, and it and it kind of just wasn't the medium that I was as comfortable with compared mm-hmm. to audio. So I switched to audio and started pushing out audio podcasts. But I think I was one of like I I'm just saying this, I'm not for sure, but I think I was one of the first podcasters in fitness. I'm like, surprised I, you say I, that tell. about the you're not comfortable with the video, you like the podcast, because I've watched many of your YouTube videos and what I like about them well, is you're not even talking. You're like actually just showing like I remember watching like core exercise. It's four minutes of you doing like an awesome core exercise series right yeah yeah no i i i totally agree with you but like for me um and and this is the way i used to be i'm not this way anymore but for me like i had to have the image perfect and i really wanted like the lighting to be and so i couldn't optimize all that stuff and this this is at the point where i thought that stuff mattered now i know it doesn't you can have a totally crappy youtube video and it will get a you know whatever a million hits so you know it's image is not that important but i thought it had to be this whole like you know cnn msnbc style (laughs) cool looking studio and so when i when i would go back and look at my videos and see it was just me sitting there talking i was like oh this sucks it was painful for you to watch and so i thought well at least i can eliminate some of those variables if i just switch to audio right because that's just radio um and so i started doing audio podcasts but that was that was huge for me doing podcasting um, and that, that I think was, was one of the bigger wins was starting to put my information out there in more than just like a blog or an article format, but in a multimedia format. Yeah, that's a good point. Cause a lot of us try and make things perfect and you know, we're never going to make it perfect now. I mean, you, now you're at the point you, you build this huge following. Now let's talk about, tell us about the story of when you remember getting your first sale, when you, when you first started monetizing. Do you remember one of those moments? Yeah, sure. And I'm I'm pausing for just a second here because my my video, um, for some reason froze. Let me see if I can pull this back. You've still got me. It's show, yeah, it's showing you on my end. Yeah. Okay. You're perfect. Well, my my video disappeared. So if um whatever. Okay. So you asked me what what was the question? The again? um the first sale. Like you're growing this following, and obviously you want to you know you left your job. Um, and sold all your businesses and you want to start generating sales. Do you remember that one of those exciting moments when you first monetized? Um, you know, I even before I, I kind of decided to go with the whole dot com thing had experimented a little bit Mm -hmm, with mm -hmm. self publishing. I created this program. I, I used to be a bodybuilder. And I made a transition from bodybuilding into triathlon, but kind of in the interim, I got really into body weight training and like just doing, doing like this whole minimalist protocol where you do like high intensity interval training and a bunch of body weight work and kind of get ripped um, without stepping foot into a gym. And I wrote this program called Shape 21, which was 21 days mm-hmm. of telling you exactly how you're supposed to exercise each day and exactly how you're supposed to eat each day. So like a no guesswork involved, you know, done for you, dummy style program. And I wrote all of it out. I, I made it into a PDF. I got it printed here locally in town, shot a DVD in the park, had the DVDs replicated locally in town. 
had all this stuff printed, and then I remember I, I drove around in my little green Acura Integra to, to all the different gyms in town, the different GNCs in town, and I would I basically just gave them the book, and it was total trust relationship. I was like, please, just just sell this. I'll give you, I think I gave them like 50% or something like that, and then you know just, just send me a check for what sells at the end of each month and i just wanted to get my name out there right and i brought this book everywhere and it was it was a ton of work but i remember really for me the cool thing and and i thought i was just the smartest guy on the face of the planet figuring out how to do this myself um, was i i figured out how to put the pdf and the recording of the book online and make it so that someone could put their credit card information online. I, I remember I signed up for an account with Practice Pay Solutions. So they gave me my credit card processing through Authorize.net. They gave me my shopping cart through OneShoppingCart.com. I put it on the internet. I linked it to my gym page. Like my gym had a page and I put a little picture of the book there and said buy this book. And I think it was $17 to get the book and the DVD or the book and the, and the video recording. And I really do remember like waking up one morning. All right, sorry, I lost you there for for a second. But I I was saying I uh, yeah I I logged in like like that morning and looked and there was the seventeen dollars there and and I remember it was it was just a cool feeling. I mean, it sounds silly and stuff now, but you know that first sale, you know, it, it's it's just crazy. And um, you know, of of course now it, that's. That's standard fare, but for me, I remember it was it was just weird, you know, to log in that first time and see the sales and everything. So, what was um, do you remember? Um, what was a big roadblock you hit early on when you were gaining momentum with with sales and monetizing the site? Do you remember one of the big roadblocks or challenges you hit up against? Mm, I, you know, I I don't know if you would classify this as a roadblock as much as like you know, a, a, kind of like a. Um, a smoke bomb, but there, there is so much out there in terms of the distractions and the opportunities and the ways that you can make money uh, online or offline. Um, the people that you can follow, the blogs that you can follow, the podcasts that you can listen to. You, especially if you're a Type A person. Um, and and I, I work with, I, you know, I, I still do a lot of consulting with people. I work with a lot of people who have adrenal fatigue, people who have literally like, like exhausted themselves. And you tend to see the same pattern over and over again. They've tried to have everything, right? They, they try to read everything. They try to listen to everything. They try to learn everything and they try to implement everything. And you, you simply cannot do that. And I did get to the point where I was trying to do that. I was following 20 different internet marketers and my feed reader had 50 different blogs in it. And I was listening to who knows how many different podcasts in the industry. And, and you simply can't do that um, without completely exhausting yourself. So you have to be like a horse with blinders, right? You need to pick those few people who you're going to follow. And you follow their those people. You choose those few resources that you're gonna you're gonna hone in on, and you follow those resources. And it's okay to miss out on some of the other stuff. It's okay to miss out on some of the extra money making opportunities. It's okay not to be implementing every Facebook, Google, Pinterest, Instagram blog technique out there. That's okay. There's no rule that you have to do everything. But if you are the type A overachiever type of person, the, you know, a lot of, probably the type of person who, you know, watches a program like this in order to pick up tips and, and things of that nature, understand that, that it's okay to just focus on a few things, be happy with that. Have, you know, I, I used to never have an end time to my work day, right? I used to run a checklist and it was just a, one big checklist. And when I was exhausted at the end of the day, and uh, and you know I just had completely run out of time. Then I would end the checklist for that day and move on to the checklist and, and just start it up again the next morning. And that's a really really bad way to go about things. So now we can I, all relate to that, though. You know, yeah, we can all relate yeah. to that. Yeah. So now I have a bucket. Every day has every day has a task. Like for example, we're recording this on a Tuesday. 
Tuesdays and Thursdays are the days that I do interviews. And those are also the days that I do consults with my clients and things of that nature. Wednesdays are the day that I record my podcast. Um, another thing I do on Tuesdays is Tuesdays are video day. Um, Friday and Saturday and Sunday are writing days. Monday is my catch-all day, my big net day that I that I'm able to do my free stuff and the stuff that I that I have an interest in and the extras and you know the little marketing techniques and you know things things like yesterday I was I was researching you know how to optimize my text messaging campaigns that I send out to people's cell phones you know stuff like that. So now every day has a has a, has a stop time, it has an end time, and yeah, I mean that. But originally that was the biggest mistake I made was trying to do everything. And had just this big, long-running checklist and just too much, you know. Right. So going from that to tell us one of those times when you had the most pivotal connection or sale that kind of you felt like, wow, this is really going on the upward trend. Mm. Um, I wouldn't say that it was a single sale, but but a traditional launch. Okay. Um, I, you know, I, I launched uh, a product that was, uh, well, I've, I've had a few such launches, but that first product that I was talking about, that triathlon dominator product, mm -hmm. I decided to launch it during one of the biggest weeks in endurance sports, which is during the week of Ironman Hawaii, which is kind of like the Super Bowl of Ironman triathlon. And I launched it. During that week, I had my email sequence all written. I had some people mailing out for me. I had I had videos leading up to that. I was starting to use my podcast to market it and spread the word at that point. Launched it, mailed out, um, had lots of buzz going about it, wrote articles for all the triathlon websites where I knew there were going to be a lot of eyeballs during that week anyways. And, you know, I, I made as much money in that week as I'd make in, in basically about, a half year or so of work as a as a personal trainer in in a single week. So I was like, I don't remember the exact figure, but it was around a sixty thousand dollar launch week, and that That's great. And, and most most of that was was me and, and not affiliates. And um, for me, that was you know when I realized that you could do that kind of stuff in a week, um, you know, and then rinse, wash, and repeat, and create more programs, and do the same thing over and over again. That was the big kind of kind of you know come to come to Jesus moment for me where I realized that yeah you can you can make money doing this and um you know I I don't know about other people but for me um what, one of the mistakes that I made early on was I didn't have like a like a mentor or somebody who was teaching me how to do these things so for me it was all just fly by the seat of my pants keep my fingers crossed that I had the credit card merchant processing set up correctly and the email sequences and you know like I said with the shape 21 program that I wrote this money was actually gonna wind up in my bank account you know and so for me it was just really cool to see that hey this stuff actually works because at that point I didn't have anybody telling me what to do I was I was just reading about stuff and doing it and hoping that it worked so what was one of the big milestones you're especially proud of now, looking back on what you've done so far? Mm. Uh, I, I think that um, a, a big, big milestone for me would be the like whenever you're creating something when you're creating a solution like for example I explained how I, I wanted to have the solution for people who wanted to do an Ironman triathlon which is a really cool accomplishment but be able to do it and still have their jobs still make money still be able to spend time with their wife and their kids um, still have time for other hobbies etc I wanted to have a way for people to do this and I knew that it worked for me and for, for some of the clients who I coach, but I'd never brought it to a bigger level. But it's part of my follow-up sequence. Basically, 36 weeks after the sale of this program, I had an autoresponder set up in my sequence that emailed people and said, hey, how'd it go? Do you have a finish line photo you can send me? Um, you know what, what, what was your story leading up to the race? Did you cross the finish line? Were you able to accomplish your dreams? You know, et cetera. And I'd kind of forgotten about having set set up that part of the autoresponder sequence in the sales sequence, but I remember that point 36 weeks out from having launched that program, 
I started to get all these emails and photos and videos of people and that, you know, crossing the finish line, arms up in the air. It's unbelievable. I did it then. And, you know, it was kind of like a little Christmas gift to me because I'd, I'd forgotten I'd set that up and started to get all these emails. And I didn't even know what to do with them at that point. I figured out eventually, you know, how to get my testimonials up on my page and, you know, up on Facebook and everything. But that was a pretty cool feeling seeing that I'd actually really help people like you know yeah. that you're helping people but then when you get the photos and the it's stories more and everything yeah yeah and what that was, was one of those do you remember cool. any of those that struck you like you're like wow i can't believe they finished an iron man that's unbelievable um <laughs> gosh let me think i mean i like um i mean it's it's at a i i i took a bunch of them put them up at triathlondominator.com and they're they're all over there but i'm trying to to remember of of one that that was that was specific. You've got me on the spot now here, thinking thinking back because this was several years ago. Right, now that, we're dusting off. That the... I was getting that I was getting all of these. Um, I think because it's probably... like the reason I ask is because like someone out there who's like, there's no way I could even do that, and like you remember right. reading one of those people and you're like, wow, like I can't believe this person finished it. It's amazing. Yeah, there was like, and, and I don't remember her exact story, but there was this mom. She had a lot of kids. She had like, it was like a lot for me. It was like seven or eight kids or something like that. <laughs> That's it a lot was, for anyone, yeah. Like, and she she had all these kids, and she I think she was she did like a 14 or 15-hour Ironman, which is actually pretty good for kind of like the average mom who's got a bunch of kids she's juggling. And... um I'd, and and her photos up there on the site, and I think she's wearing like a like a blue uniform, and it was it was Iron Man. I remember which Iron Man it was. It may have been Canada, but I remember reading her story just about how she was still able to to like raise her kids and spend time with her kids and be, you know, the stereotypical soccer mom, but then go out and do something that ninety nine percent of the people on the face of the planet have never even considered being able to do in their lives, and you know and and she made it and she was healthy and and she you know crossed the finish line uninjured and she followed the program and did all the strength training and for me i think maybe just because family and kids and stuff like that are, are so important that that really struck me i mean sure there were guys who whatever ceos and whatever who were able to still run their companies and finish the race and stuff but for me i thought it was cool to hear kind of like the family component right um you know cuz there's been entire you know, I remember the Wall Street Journal article that came out that said a workout, it, a workout destroyed my marriage was the name of the article. Wow. Yeah. And it was about this whole, you know, this this new generation of people who are doing marathons and triathlons and CrossFit or whatever. And they get so caught up in this fitness component that they start neglecting their family and you know, neglecting their kids and skipping soccer games to go on bike rides and stuff like that. And right. um, I think it's cool that my program helped to kind of keep families together and still allow a mom or a dad to achieve something like that. So I wanted to ask you too, like you brought it up earlier in the interview about, um, you know, early on you wish you would have surveyed people more. What's a feature or a product that users demanded that if you weren't listening to your customers, because now you realize that's like important and you do that a lot, that you wouldn't have realized? What's something people demanded that, that they asked mm. you for? You know, I I run um, I run a, a a few different continuity programs and membership websites, and one is called the Rockstar Triathlete Academy, where mm -hmm. we teach people how to how to learn the sport of triathlon or become faster at the sport of triathlon. And um, we protected our videos on that website using a using basically a mechanism that allowed us to embed our videos on a on a uh, I think we we're using like an Amazon S3 server and people would you know buy the membership to the website and be able to access those and we didn't really survey our audience in the beginning about how they wanted content delivered and stuff like that but we realized that all of these cool videos that we shot and we spent months creating all the content for this program and everything put it up on the server and you know put it on the video but the the way that we had everything set up was you couldn't watch these videos on on your phone um, mm. or, or your iPad and we just started to get tons of emails in from folks and they were like this is I can't watch this when I'm out at the gym or you know when I'm out in the field getting ready to do my run program like I, I, you got to be signed into your big desktop computer or whatever to, to watch so we had to reinvent the whole program and 
you know, we had, we ended up actually just putting everything as unlisted videos on YouTube just because it works so well for for phones and stuff like that. But I remember that as being kind of like a, a a big oops moment when we realized that we had all this cool content, this huge vault of content, and we kind of set it up the wrong way, you know, in terms of the way that people wanted to truly access it. So we could have easily fixed that by, you know, having like a like a membership survey that asked people how they were actually accessing the content. But, you know, you, know, you, li- you live and learn from stuff like that. Oh, so. that's a great example. Because, like, it's something when you're creating it, you're in your own mind just creating it, and you're not thinking, this person's sitting at the gym with their phone trying to watch it. So that's yeah. a perfect story, yeah. Because you're not, you're not digesting your own content. And, and really, like, that was a whole, like... I was completely resistant to the idea of getting a fancy phone and you know I, I was the whole like $20 phone guy I'm, I'm just I'm not into stuff like I drove the same car through high school through college um, you know I'd, I was never into in houses and cars and cool technology and, and gadgets and stuff like that but the whole reason that I bought my first iPhone was just because I wanted to see how people were digesting my content because I kept getting all these emails like I can't do this on my phone I can't do that right. so I was like I, I was like I, I guess I better get a phone and start <laughs> looking at what I'm doing on a phone so um, yeah that's really important to to be able to think about as you're creating content because a lot of times we create content but we don't watch it because it's like our content right we created it we know what it is and and but you have to kind of look at your content. So now I'm always visiting my website on my phone and, and looking at my material. I listen to my own podcasts, which sounds really narcissistic. I, but do, I do the same thing. You learn like, a lot. I want, yeah, you learn a ton. And you realize a lot of stuff that you're doing wrong when you try and just put yourself in your customer's shoes. So especially from a content digestion standpoint. So Ben, what's – I mean there's a lot of great information so far. What's one thing – that the audience should start doing right now to start getting momentum in their first sale or cult, you know, their cult following like you have? Um, don't start big. Um, and, and what I mean by that is this whole concept of like the thousand true fans that, you know, sorry, my, my lawn care guy just decided to start weed eating in front of my office window. Apologize for that noise. Um, you can hardly anyways, hear it, actually. So yeah, okay, good. Um, but basically, this whole concept of a thousand true fans—I um, forget who wrote the original article. It's one that Tim Ferriss has talked about. But you don't need a, a ton of followers. Like, and you don't need to be this big, faceless corporation. I still personally respond. Okay, so so here's an here's an example. Like. I have I have my newsletter opt-in form that people sign up for at bengreenfieldfitness.com. People sign up for that. One of the first messages that they receive is, hey, it's Ben. I just want to thank you so much for signing up for my newsletter. Please, 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 if there's anything that I can help you with, just hit reply to this email and I'll point you in the right direction. Um, anything you need, just let me know. And I still personally respond to those emails every day. And like if you you don't have to have this big like huge newsletter list like my list is not that big like i i think it's smaller than what most people probably might think that it is but it's super duper responsive cuz they're all true fans cuz i really really care for my audience and for my fans and for my clients so that's what's really important to realize is you don't need a lot of followers you don't need a lot of customers what you need are a small number of loyal customers who will hang on every word that you say and remember it's always easier to retain a current customer than it is to get a new one so understand that that there you, you don't need to be some big faces corporation take care of the people that are coming to you form a really really strong relationship with them and if you do that things will end up taking care of themselves and kind of the the extra bonus that I'll throw in there is a lot of those relationships that I've formed just by hitting reply to an email a lot of times those people wind up being more important and connected people than you'd think who you actually do impress quite a bit by taking care of them and that's really opened up some doors for me as well just just caring and showing people that I care. Sometimes you never know who it is that you're actually impressing, so to speak. Yeah, for sure. And I have a, a lot more questions, but 
with your busy day. I'm going to ask one more question. But before I do, I want you to just tell the audience a little bit more about the businesses that you have and what you're working on now that's exciting to you. Um, so uh, I, I, I consider myself to be kind of a, a teacher um, and maybe a little bit of a connector in terms of like guests that I give on my podcast and things of that nature. But, um, you know, be, because I do think of myself as a teacher, as an educator, um, the biggest project I'm working on right now is a book. I'm writing a book in which I teach people how to still participate in endurance sports and do the sport that they love and do these triathlons and marathons and avoid a lot of the health issues that creep up when you're doing these things. There's a lot of people that are healthy on the outside but sick on the inside with hormone problems and heart issues uh, because they're beating their bodies up and not taking care of themselves. So I'm working on a book that really teaches people how to still do this sport that they love and not not hurt their body. So that's one big project of mine. Do you have the, the title project, yet or is it still in the works? Yeah, it's called Beyond Training, okay. Mastering Endurance, Health, and Life. Okay. And so, so um, I'm working on that pretty intensively. So I've been writing a lot. And then I'm also um, I'm, I'm launching a new company, very similarly, kind of kind of similar avenue, in which I'm creating uh, supplement and gear and lifestyle solutions for people, particularly in in the endurance sports realm, who want you know. So so I'm basically doing a lot a lot more private labeling. Whereas at this point, I work with a lot of other companies and recommend their stuff. And I have a central warehouse in Philadelphia where I ship a lot of stuff out from. I'm going to start to bring a lot of that stuff in-house and, and do a lot more private labeling, basically. So those are two big projects that I'm working on this year. And What's the nutritional company called so they can check it out? Well, it's called Rev Supplements. It's okay. at revsupplements.com. Okay. Um, it's it's slated to launch in September. Um, we're going to start it off as as primarily supplements, and then branch into training gear, um, recovery gear, and and things of that nature. But yeah, it's called it's called Rev, um, and the whole component, or the whole idea behind it, is you want people to be able to live the Rev lifestyle, to get revved, to be part of the Rev tribe. And the revolution, really, you know, the revolution. Yeah, yeah. It, in a way, really. And 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 again, it's also based on this whole concept of being healthy on the outside and healthy on the inside. Um, for for the more extreme people, the people who are climbing Mount Everest and doing Ironman triathlons and stuff like that. So yeah, I mean, you also have RockstarTriathlete.com, which I've checked out, and people should definitely check out BenGreenfieldFitness.com, which has a lot of great articles and podcasts too. Yeah, and then uh, I run a, a, a an endurance sports entertainment network over at enduranceplanet.com where we do videos and podcasts and things like that for endurance athletes. Um, and uh, yeah, then there's the, the Get Fit Guy podcast. And but yeah, I mean, if you go to bengreenfieldfitness.com, you know, I, I recommend that everyone have a portal, kind of a hub that they that they branch everything out from. And so for me, it's it's the bengreenfieldfitness.com is mm -hmm. kind of like the best place to start. So. So Ben, my last question is, what's the craziest thing you've tested on your body? Like I know you've done like oxygen tents and I've watched a video of you getting in this like the coldest thing it looks like I've ever seen. <laughs> a hypobaric chamber. <laughs> right. And you were like, ah, oh, it's not that cold. I'm, I was like shivering watching you. <laughs> I mean, you've done bodybuilding, Ironman. Tell us a crazy thing. Even I mean, if you say it's crazy, it's got to be like beyond crazy because... Just doing an Ironman, I think, is you have to be a little crazy or a lot crazy. So what's one thing you tested on your own body that looking back, you're like, that was that your wife would be like, never do that again. Oh, gosh. Um, or if you have more than one, that's fine. You know, I, I do. I do a ton of stuff like a, a cold thermogenesis, you know, 40 degree ice bath soaks for hours and um, you know, I have this fat burning vest that I wear. Um, let me think of the, the craziest thing I, I do. I do electro stim almost every day. So I hook myself up to electrodes and do like uh, basic where, shock therapy on myself. Where, to, where do you look it up? Stimulate muscles. Um, Just on your legs any, or? Anywhere. Yeah. Legs, um, arms, upper body. Um, 
Let me think. Gosh, it's it's like a lot of this stuff is so normal for me. That I I'm know. That's what. What would your what wife would be say? like? The most. What would your wife be shocking? like? Ben, don't do that ever again. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, probably it would be the cold thermogenesis thing. Um, specifically, the really really intense cold thermogenesis. So there's like this guy named Wim Hof who's known as the Ice Man who uh he he's done like a marathon up Everest wearing his basketball shorts and you Are know you just joking? just crazy crazy stuff like wow. that. So one um this this was last spring in about April when the river was just like like ice had just melted. And so I put on a, a wetsuit and went into the river and swam upstream for 2 hours. Wow. Um just just to see what happened to the body when you expose it to that level of cold combined with with exercise at the same time um made the mistake of driving myself to the river i was gonna to say you can get like hypothermia uh, can't you and die yeah well i actually don't i don't remember I, I remember swimming and i remember waking up in the bathtub at home so at, at some point i blacked out but i still had consciousness because i, I somehow drove home and wow. you know, but i don't remember any of it so my brain somehow shut down um, I completely lost bowel function. Like it was just, it was nasty. I was just, I was cold for like the next 48 hours straight. Jeez. And you know, the whole idea is that cold thermogenesis is supposed to shut down inflammation and shuts down amp everything. Up fat burning, Jeez. amp up fat burning enzymes and everything. But I really kind of like overdid it just because I wanted <laughs> this to kind of see what, what the body would do. And I, I do remember, you know, you asked me about what my wife would say. <laughs> I remember her telling me, do not ever go do that. Like, so I still don't go. And, and like overdoing swim. it for most people is like yeah. they had an extra piece of pizza. Like, right. Like, I think I overdid a little right. bit with that. Yeah. But I mean, now, now I track things pretty intensively. Like I have these uh, little uh, blood testers. And so I, every week I send my blood off to a company called Talking 20. So every single week I test my blood for a hundred different biomarkers and, and get the results sent back to me. And, um, so I keep pretty close tabs on things now, but yeah, I do. I'm, I'm big time into the biohacking stuff, and it's fun. But I would say just be careful with the cold thermogenesis. Do thing. not recommend it home. <laughs> be careful with that one. <laughs> well, Ben, I thank you so much for your time. I know you have to go out and run a triathlon or do something crazy right now. So thanks, and uh, the audience is going to love this one. I appreciate it. Hey, thanks, Jeremy. <laughs>